All right, this is going to be uh, more of a short message. And then I'm planning on having more time for, for ministry time. It just seems like there's been a lot of uh, stirring, of course, going on. You know, we had the As- Asbury Revival, and it's spread to different campuses, and Texas A&M now is really having a move. And, and so it's spreading different places. And so I feel like what the Lord is saying is that there's an invitation. So there's an invitation for Church on the Rock, and it's not just Church on the Rock, but it's for His body at this time. Because this is the time, you know, it, today is the day of salvation. We know that that's always available for people. But there are times, those Kairos times, where the Lord specifically sets a time where he begins to move. And there's just a stirring now in the spirit that's going on across this nation. And as I was thinking about all this, I, you know, and reading different articles uh, from different uh, pastors talking about what's going on and what's happening and, and what they kind of see. And one that caught my ear, uh, eye was uh, Anne Graham Lotz, you know, Billy Graham's daughter. And the title of it was, Is This the Last Awakening? And that really caught my attention. I thought, that's a great question. You know, we're at the very beginning of the beginning of revival, not even moving yet into the awakening stage. But could this be the last one? And if it is, what would your response be? What would be different? What would you do different? If you knew for sure that this move of God was going to be the last opportunity for a lot of people to come into the kingdom of God, would that change your life? And so as, as I was pondering that, I think, you know, it very well could be the last one. None of us know. We can't, none of us can say. But I think we ought to live like it is. Like this is the last time that God is going to have mercy, that he's again bringing his spirit. He's pouring it out. He's bringing new wine, as we sang earlier. He's inviting us in question becomes, are we going to say yes? We probably won't say no, but we'll just probably ignore it. But he wants our yes. And I want to start with the scripture just out of uh, Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. And this is a, a familiar Verse, and it's one that actually a lot of times is actually misused or is taken out of context. Because a lot of times we use that like in, in this verse in evangelism. And it says, Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him and he with me. So the Lord is standing at the door, and a lot of times we use that as evangelism. But actually what he's knocking on the door, he's knocking on the door of the church, his people. Because if you read it in context, it's it's about the church of Laodicea. So I kind of want to go back and look at that. But when he said about coming in and eating with him, that talks about having a deeper walk a deeper fellowship about having intimacy with him and entering in to what the Lord is doing. So if we go back to verse uh, 14, we'll just read through that passage of what he's saying to the church at Laodicea. He says, To the angel of the church in Laodicea write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one of the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I am about to spit you out of my mouth. You say I am rich, 
I have acquired wealth and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so you can become wit, rich and white clothes to wear so you can cover your shameful nakedness and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Verse 19, those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. Here I am, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him. So there's that invitation that is going out. It's an invitation for this specific time of history, which we all happen to be alive at this time. And so the Lord is knocking. He's knocking at our door, and He wants to come in and have fellowship. He wants us to join with what He is doing. And if you turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 12, And I want to just read verses 35 and 36. And as Jesus is speaking, he says, Be dressed, ready for service, and keep your lamps burning. In other words, keep your fire, keep that Holy Spirit burning within you. Like men waiting for their master to return from a wedding banquet. So that when he comes and knocks, they can immediately open the door for him. So again, this picture of he's at the door, he's knocking. Stay awake, be ready for service, keep that lamp, that Holy Spirit, that fire within you. Keep it stoked. Don't let it go out. And if you turn over to chapter 14... Of Luke. And starting in verse 15, we have the, the parable of the great banquet. And it says, When one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, Blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. And Jesus replied, A certain man was preparing a great banquet, and he invited many guests. Now at the time of the banquet, he sent his servants to tell those who had been invited, Come, for everything is now ready. So there's a banquet. The man, obviously, is the Lord. And he sent out invitations beforehand. So the invitations have gone out. And so now he says, come, for everything is now ready. And then, again, it's one of those Kairos times. It's a time now is the time. But in verse 18, he says, they, they all, like, begin to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go and see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I have just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. Still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. So they have all these excuses. So the invitation went out. The Lord says, Hey, it's time. Come. And they all begin to make excuses. Life is busy, you know, I got a lot going on right now. I just don't really have the time. I'd like to, but excuse me. And then verse 21 says, The servant came back and reported this to his master. 
Then the owner of the house became angry, and he ordered his servants, go out quickly into the streets and the alley and the town and bring in the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you have ordered we have done, but there is still room. Then the master told his servant, go out into the roads and the country lanes and make them come in so that my house may be full. I tell you, not one of those men who were invited will get a taste of my banquet. So again, he prepared a banquet, sent the invitations out, tells them now is the time. It's time now. This is one of those times. Come. But everybody began to make excuses why they couldn't come. Now, as I said before, you don't, when we move into a time of revival, a time of the moving of the Spirit, it takes a lot of work. There's a cost to it. There's a cost to our own lives. What's obviously these who were invited weren't able or want, didn't want to pay the cost. So if you just want to have church as usual, not wanting to pay a cost, then we can just continue on as we always have. But if you want a true, authentic revival and a move of our spirit that changes lives and hearts and brings in a great harvest, there's a cost to it. And that means that we have to make changes in our lives, changes in our priorities. Where we truly seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, knowing that all these other things will be added unto us. And so the next few passage, right, as we go on in Luke, it talks about the cost of being a disciple. It says large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and his mother, his wife and children, his brother and his sister, yet even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And anyone who does not carry his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Now, Jesus is using hyperbole there because he wants to make a point. Because obviously, the, the word tells us to honor your father and mother. We are to love our family. But he said, in comparison to Jesus, in comparison to the Lord, nothing should separate us from him and what he wants to do and his plans and his purposes. And in verse 28, says, Suppose one of you want to build a tower. Will he not first sit down and estimate the cost to see if he has enough money to complete it? For if he lays the foundation and is not able to finish it, everyone will see it and will ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Will he not first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long ways away. And he will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, any of you who does not give up everything he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be salty again? It is fit neither for the soil nor for the manure pile. It is thrown out. He who has an ear, hear what the Spirit says. 
So there is a cost again, and I don't want to minimize that cost. And so it takes a yes from us, a yes in our hearts to say, yes, I'm willing to pay that cost. You need to count the cost and then realize, though, that there's nothing more important than what the Lord is doing and willing to give up whatever, willing to change our schedules, line ourselves up with what he wants to do and what he's calling us to do. So one of the questions I have is, how do we reorient our life around the Lord rather than ourselves? For most of us, we orient our life around ourselves. But we're coming to a season where the Lord wants to reorient us around what he's doing. And again, that takes, that takes a yes in our heart. Because we are on the verge, again, the very beginning steps of revival and into an awakening. And I want all of us to be a part of that. But we also need to count the cost and be willing to say, yes, whatever it costs, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to run hard. I was, uh, this past week, uh, Mike Mickle had, a, had a, a staff meeting, leaders meeting, and he said it was the most important one of his 50 years in ministry. And basically calling for, remember, I, I told you about in the past how we've had a connection back to 1983, 40 years ago, to the 21-day fast, and how, of course, I wasn't even aware there was a church on the rock or, you know, any of that, but how there was a connection with Fred Crop, other, some of you guys who were there who were involved in that. And so there was this, uh, this connection going on in the spirit that we didn't have a, an idea about. But he was saying, again, for, so it's been 40 years, so starting uh, May 7th through May 28th, the same dates, 40 years ago, calling for another fast. And the main purpose that they're seeing is for, uh, for Jerusalem and for Israel. But there's a lot more that I believe is in that. I think it's a lot has to do with what wasn't fulfilled back 40 years ago that the Lord wants to fulfill now, which is the mighty move of His Spirit. And could this be the last one? Could this be the last awakening? I think we need, again, to live like it is. We don't know that, but it's, it's very possible. And there's multitudes that are in the valley of decision. Multitudes that need to come to the Lord. There are prodigals. And I, the Lord's really been moving on my heart lately about the prodigals that need to come back to the Lord. That the Lord's going to begin to call back those maybe uh, sons or granddaughters and grandsons that who have walked away from the Lord and their life has been a, a mess maybe even. But the Lord is calling them back. And so we need to intensify our prayers to see that happen. And the Lord is going to start moving upon them. He's able to, just like he does with the Muslims. And, in, you know, in Iran right now, there's so many Muslims coming to the Lord because this guy in white is showing up in their dreams and in visions. And it's Jesus. And they're coming to know the Lord. No one's witnessing to them. But he's appearing to them. And so he's beginning to move mightily in different countries that have no opportunity, really, for the gospel. So this is a season. Like I say, it's one of those important seasons of the Lord where we're, again, at the very beginning, but we need to embrace, we need to have a yes in our hearts to say, Lord, whatever it is, I'm willing to do whatever it takes to place myself again, just like we do here when we worship, Wednesday nights when we come before the Lord, 
just putting our cold hearts before his fire and letting him melt that heart and give us a heart to, and a, a mind that begin to focus of the things of eternity rather than this life. Because we're so caught up. I mean, all of us are. Because our day-to-day life. You know, it, it's like the, the sower went out and, and he says, you know, one of the biggest groups, the third group was oh, the cares and the worries of this life, you know, squished it and there was no fruit coming from it. And so we need to begin to put priorities in line with what the Lord wants to do. And so this is happening all across. There's, there's just a stirring going on within people's hearts. So this is the hour to line ourselves up with what he wants to do. And as I said, this is going to be a shorter message because I want to have us just spend time doing some worship and offering ourselves before and answering that question. Each of us answering that question, are we willing, are we willing to say yes not even knowing exactly what that's going to require, but that we would say yes to him and be prepared for what he's calling us to do. So I'm going to have, Jesse, if you go ahead and come up. I uh, I'm going to pray. And we're just going to see, I don't know for sure, what this looks like, how it's going to happen. And so I just ask for each of you just to set before the Lord, focus on his presence, ask the Lord questions. So, Lord, we just come before you as we we present ourselves before you. We say, Lord, here we are. Here we are, Lord. Lord, we don't want to miss what you're doing. Lord, we want to say yes. We don't want to be one of those, Lord, who are making excuses. Lord, we want to be on the cups of what you're doing. We want to join ourselves with you. We want to know you more. We want to open that door that as you're knocking at the door of the church as you continue to knock we want to say yes Lord we want to open that door we're asking Lord saying Lord we as we sang earlier Lord about the new wine as we sang about the wind of your spirit coming we say we welcome you Holy Spirit We say, come, Holy Spirit, and do what you do within us. Touch the hearts of this people. Move us, Lord. Come, Lord.